My name is Donnie Young, and welcome to the introduction video for the Assessment of Student Online Engagement project. My team members for this project are me, myself, Daniel Young, and Mohamed Sayed. My product owners are Dr. Prabhakar and Dr. Rangaswamy. My professor for this semester is Dr. Masood Sajadi. Let's start with the problem. The current problem at hand is that online course enrollment and recorded lectures are increasing in the modern academic environment but instructors missing out on crucial course consumption data. For example, in an in-person class, instructors can get a general feel for the students who are participating, as well as who is present in their lectures. Instructors have key questions, such as how, many, how much a lecture are these uh, students viewing, are they rewatching, which lectures are most popular, and when are they? Perhaps things like whether students are viewing the lectures again before a test, or maybe viewing it on time or in a timely manner. Online, this is not the case for every solution. For this particular project, I'll be focusing on the Memento system. Mementos is an online course video service that provides transcription for all lectures and the ability to quickly search key terms across the course. At the current time, Mementos doesn't have any analytics, just as I've mentioned. And in this semester, I've been tasked with creating a proof of concept for this. My goals have been to find out which metrics are the most pertinent, and secondly, what data is needed for them. My goals and requirements for the semester, as stated, is that the instructors can view their courses, lectures, and students at different levels and view the relevant and engagement information. Secondly, it needs to provide a clean API for storing and retrieving this data from the front end application or the course viewing application. And the solution needs to generate its own test viewership data at this point, Mementos isn't recording this data. The system requirements are that it must be uh, developed in JavaScript, and in this case, using React for the front end. The stories that I've completed over the semester are shown here. The first two sprints started off with me learning JavaScript, as well as the environment setup, and creating a simple proof of concept. For the most part, this is a simple API and the ability to view the API data through React frontend. As I move into the later sprints, the course overview page, details page, lectures page, as well as video analytics are added in. This is to create the full solution as present today. Stories number 12 and 13 pertain directly to the data seeder. At its original inception, it created random values for courses, lectures, etc. 13 added some further configuration, as well as refactored it to work better with the overall API. Well, let's move on to the use cases. The first and simplest is data seeding. An actor is able to see data, as well as clear the data that's in the database. In this case, we see seeding data. Once the request to see the data is created, the backend app goes ahead and creates all the objects needed. In this case, the user doesn't even interact with the front end API. They'd be interacting with the back end Swagger API. Well, let's move on to viewing lecture analytics. As you can see here in the total system composition, the actor is able to view courses, browse courses, and which includes the course details and browsing lectures, which includes the lecture details and the lecture analytics. In this sequence diagram, all the portions of the application are at play, the front end, back end, and MongoDB. In this case, the user requests the main page, clicks on a course, requests the course, clicks sees the lectures available, requests a lecture, and in this case, the lecture page is the end goal, to go ahead and see the information at the lecture level as well as to see the per student information. You'll see this broken down a lot better in the end of the video. The progression of the stories is mostly in a waterfall situation, kept one story at a time. The overall solution is composed of three parts. It follows a simple flow between them. The front end receives requests for the web page, and stores up React through application that executes in the client's browser. The backend serves to decouple the database and provide application logic for processing the data. 
MongoDB serves as the data store for the project with four collections under a main database. Those collections being a course collection, a lecture collection, user, and view collections. Let's take a look at the architecture of each of these pieces, in particular the front end and the back end. The back end uses a layered architecture that breaks the request and response flow into a series of layers. Each layer is used to segregate responsibilities and allow for the addition of new logic at the appropriate layer. As seen in the diagram, the request is processed by each piece until the final modifications are made to the underlying data store. The front end uses a composition architecture, where each React component is composed of smaller components, or HTML primitives. This is the standard React design style, and it leads to encapsulation of logic and configuration, and leads to the configuration to the component through a simple entry exit point to maximize encapsulation. The deployment relies heavily on Docker. The two code bases are gone ahead and wrapped up in Docker containers and sit in a virtual network with MongoDB. From here, the user can hit the front end, which will interact with the back end, which interacts with MongoDB, and which are all exposed. The data model for the project has been kept simple and normalized to avoid complexity at this stage. A shortcoming is that some of the new front-end pages have multiple levels of data that need to be queried. For example, maybe a page will need to query both the lecture, the view data for the lecture, and also the course. Without complex tables, this will require multiple trips to the backend. But as stated before, I'd like to keep the data as simple and normalized as possible to allow for more flexibility at the current stages. The course is the highest object in this chain. It contains references to the lectures and the users. Below this lecture object contains a view object per user, and that is a wrapper around the view data. This is the actual data that is kept, being the start time for when the user started watching a video and the end time when they've ended as well as a date associated with it. I've been tasked with presenting a particular, particularly interesting algorithm from this project. In this case, view times for the user attract as unique ranges, and these ranges are tracked over seconds from start to end. When a user revisits a video or watches a section, the ranges overlap and lead to skewed metrics. For example, if I were to have somebody watch a video three times and simply add up all of the time that they viewed, they may have over 100% of the video viewed. What I needed to do is create a simple algorithm that went ahead and combined all the ranges into their simplest composition, taking ranges that overlap, taking ranges that consume other ranges, and simplifying them to see what exactly did the user view. The diagram on the next page will break this down a lot better. As you can see here, multiple view instances are there. We see that four doesn't collide with anything, but view instance two collides with view instance one, as well as view instance three. Well, the algorithm starts by going through the view instances, starting from the first to the end, and goes ahead and sees that view instances one and two are colliding, and we'll go ahead and combine them together. The same computation is done with view instance three. The end result is that view instances 1, 2, and 3 are combined, and view instance 4 on the side is left alone. The code for this acts in place. The main gist of it is that iterating over the sorted ranges, which is very important, that ranges are sorted by their start range, The overlapping of the start and end ranges are checked, and the resultant range is then combined. It goes ahead and takes the, let's say, the ith range, goes ahead and combines it with i plus 1 if they happen to collide, and we'll go ahead and take the 
starting point, the lowest starting point between i and i plus 1, and takes the highest ending point between i and i plus 1. And we'll go ahead and decrement the index. Index, in this case, is actually because the system is doing this modification in place. Goes ahead and basically will, for other words, keep track of how many actual real objects are in this array. So as this goes ahead and scans through the array, it'll modify the objects in the front, going ahead and taking them, combining them, and it moves on to the next step. It'll go ahead and see if there's anything to combine that one with. In the end, the actual ranges that we have left will most likely be less than the ranges we started with. That's what an index is tracking. Index will go ahead and at the end, we use index to slice the array. Going ahead and seeing if we had a range of we had an array of 20 ranges and only 10 of them make out on the other side, index would be 10. And we would go ahead and take the original modified array of length 20, being 10 ranges that have been uh, that are the results of this algorithm, and then the 10 left that are untouched. Those 10 left at the at the end, after the slice, will be removed. The end summary is that I've created a solution for viewing and analyze is doing viewership data that's been created ad hoc by the system. The generated viewership data is configurable. Data is viewable from multiple levels at the current point, lecture, and student level. Again, my name is Daniel Young. Here's my email, and thank you for watching this video.